Welcome to the Dinosaur George podcast, a show about paleontology and other earth sciences. Dinosaur George is a public speaker, author, and TV host with 30 years of study in paleontology. He has performed live in over 4,500 events across the US and Canada. Now, here is Dinosaur George. Hey there, everybody. It's raining in San Antonio, which is great. It's a Monday, and there's no better way to start off a Monday than having it rain. And I know that sounds crazy, but when you live in South Central Texas, where we don't get as much rain as I wish we could, uh, we're grateful whenever we get any sort of rain. So I'm absolutely thrilled that it's raining here in San Antonio. This is podcast number 124. Welcome, everybody. For everybody listening on the podcast, I hope you're doing well. For everybody on YouTube, it's nice to see you all again. Um, In this episode, we're going to have an interview, really good interview, with Dr. Uh, Devin Denny. Uh, Dr. Denny is a geologist, and he's got some really, really cool stuff to say. I enjoyed enjoyed the interview with Dr. Denny a lot. Learned a lot, too. You know, geology is absolutely tied into paleontology. So for those of you that are thinking about paleontology as a career, you have to remember that geology is going to be the thing that you have to understand in order to even begin to guess where to look. If it wasn't for an understanding of the rocks, there was no way that you'd be able to even begin to guess where you should go look for fossils. So Geology is an absolute key important part of paleontology, and Dr. Denny gives us some really cool information. And I'll tell you, um, I was amazed at some of the stuff. I, I I had never heard some of the things that he's going to talk about. So I had recorded that earlier, so we'll get to that in just a bit. Um, we're going to do something a little bit different this time, and that is uh, we're going to start off with the Ask Dinosaur George segment uh, I don't have a lot. I, I can't get to a lot of those, but I want to go ahead and start off with those uh, with some of the uh, with the Dinosaur George segment. So let's just dive right in and start answering some of these questions you guys sent. It's time to ask Dinosaur George. In this segment, George answers your questions about paleontology. If you would like to leave a voice message, call us at 210-888-9077. This is not a toll-free call, so children, please ask your parents permission. If you would like to submit your question in writing, go to dinosaurgeorge.com and click the Ask Dinosaur George page. Questions are chosen at random and we clear all messages monthly. So if you have a question about paleontology, ask Dinosaur George. All right, we're going to get started with a... uh message we got from the Ask Dinosaur George page. This is from Nicholas from San Antonio, Texas. Hey, my hometown, Nicholas, how are you? Said, hey, Dinosaur George, I'm new at this, but I met you last week at Children's Lighthouse. I remember that, Nicholas. I remember you walked up and introduced yourself and told me that you've watched some of the videos. So welcome to the group. I, I hope that you, uh, I hope you stay with us a long time. So Nicholas asked, I have two questions for you. Can a pack of Deinonychus beat a pack of Ostroraptors? Well, Ostroraptor is so much larger than Deinonychus that Um, I don't think there's any way Deinonychus would be able to defend itself uh, with a group or without a group against something as large as Ostoraptor. And I believe Deinonychus is mid-Cretaceous. I think Ostoraptor is late Cretaceous. And if I'm right, the advantage would be that the evolutionary advancements that Ostoraptor has would make him even more formidable, even though he's bigger and more dangerous uh, brain capacity-wise and um, the way evolution works is it, it it's a learning curve. It kind of, if you're smart and you learn, you can advance. If you're not, you get wiped off the face of the earth. And so when you see raptors progressing in time, the more in time they go, the more um, uh, experiences they've gained and the smarter they become. And when I say smart, I don't mean they're sitting down at a typewriter and typing out words, but what I mean is that their experiences in life are much greater and much more advanced. So I suspect that there is no doubt in my mind that an Ostroraptor or a pack of Ostroraptors could beat a a pack or a single uh, Deinonychus. His second question is, can Crylophosaurus beat a Dilophosaurus? Yeah, Crylophosaurus, much bigger, much more advanced than Dilophosaurus. Dilophosaurus is a relatively 
uh, Dilophosaurus is a relatively lightly built dinosaur. You know, um, if you ever look at some of its bones, especially its skull, it's not a very powerful animal in, in that it's designed for confrontation. Crylophosaurus is not a major heavyweight, but he's certainly capable of taking on something his size or larger. And I don't think uh, Dilophosaurus is like that. I think Dilophosaurus is much better suited for smaller game. All right. Thank you so much for writing to me. Let's go on to Mr. Triceratops from Hell Creek Formation. Well, Mr. Triceratops, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Mr. Triceratops says, if paleontologists determine ceratopsians by their rostral bone instead of their horned faces, why is the genus still named ceratopsians? Ah, that's a very, very impressive question. First, for those of you, ceratopsians include any of those dinosaurs like Triceratops, Styracosaurus, Pachyrhinosaurus, Chasmosaurus, um, Taurosaurus, all of those guys. Uh, any of the guys with the frills and the horn faces. Um, so his question is, how, why do they identify them by their rostral bone? Well, the rostral bone is the nose section. And the reason why that's uh, helpful in order to identify species, Mr. Triceratops, is because the horn configuration on dinosaurs can sort of be like the horn configuration of cows. Let's say you have a herd of registered Holstein cows, meaning all of those cows have never been bred with anything outside of the Holstein uh, species. Well, that makes sure that you get pure Holstein, that it's a, a much better quality cow if you're if you're wanting quality milk. So um, you can line all those cows up. But one of the things you'll notice, two things you'll notice. One, none of them are colored exactly the same, even though they are black and white. It's like zebras. Everybody's got his own pattern. But more importantly, the horns can look different on these individual animals. Even though they belong to the same species, their horns can look completely different uh, but between each individual species or each individual member of that group. So if you only looked at the horns as a way to identify that particular animal, what you would come up with is you might come up with 25 different subspecies when in fact there was really only one animal. So you can't solely rely on the shape, the size, or the condition of the horn or the position of the horn to positively identify them. Now, it's important because if you look at a Styracosaurus and you look at a Triceratops, well, there's absolutely no doubt that they're completely different. What I mean is that if you have a Ceratopsian whose horns come up and then curve upwards slightly or crooked or sideways or whatever, it doesn't necessarily mean that's a new species. So leaving them in the group of Ceratopsians, the, the rostral is not the only bone that's used to identify. It's certainly one of them, but it's not the only one. So that's why I hope that makes sense to you. Um, I, I hope that made sense to you, Mr. Triceratops. Thank you for writing to me. All right, let's jump into Alex from San Antonio. Whoa, another San Antonio. This is so cool. Uh, Alex says, hey, DG, how are you? My question for you is, other than a unique zebra-like coloration, how would the Hagerman's horse be any different from today's horses? Same for Bison Antiquus and Arctotus, the short-faced bear. Other than a slightly larger body size from today's Bison's bear, horses, etc., what else was so different about them? And how did these animals that are, in my opinion, quite similar to today's animals go extinct? Was it climate change, hunted to death by humans? What do you think? Thanks, Dinosaur George. Hey, listen, man, that Alex, that's a very, very good question. Speaking of Alex, every time I hear the name Alex, I immediately think of my buddy in, in England, Alex. Alex, I hope you're doing well, buddy. Uh, okay, so Alex, your question. Okay, outwardly, yes, some of these animals look very similar to modern animals, but it's the skeletal structure that can show differentiation between modern animals. Let's take the short-faced bear, for instance. I'm more, in, I'm, I'm more aware or, or knowledgeable of the short-faced bear than I am of the Hagerman horse and even Bison Antiquus, for that matter. Um, immediately, one of the things that stands out is the shape of the skull. Very considerably different from modern bears. Modern bears have a longer snout. Short-faced bear has a very, very shortened snout. So immediately, um, you can immediately tell that's distinctively different from modern. Second, the length of the forelimbs. When you look at Arctotus simus, the short-faced bear, he's got much longer front legs and back legs than modern bears. So those, even though you look at pictures and you go, well, that's a bear and grizzly bears are bear, 
they don't look that much difference. When you really look closely, you can tell those sort of distinctive features that make it different. Same with the Hagerman's horse, same with Bison Antiquus. Yes, they look very similar, but they uh, they are distinctively different when you look closely at the skeletal structure. Now, as to why they went extinct and some of their other counterparts survived, that goes back to having to do with the ability to have evolutionary advancements that are beneficial to you. Let's look at again the short. Well, let's look at the the let's look at uh, Bison Antiquus. Okay. Today's bison is called bison bison. The prehistoric version was bison antiquus. What is different about those two probably had to do with, um, let's say diet might be an example. As environmental change is occurring and the forest areas are giving way to the great open plains, there's a couple of things that you have to have to be able to digest the tough vegetation of the open plains. Two things. Uh, three things, the dentiary, the teeth, you need the right kind of teeth. Any tooth doesn't necessarily function that well. You have to have the right musculature in the jaws to be able to grind that food. And three, you have to have the necessary bacteria in your gut to decompose that. If you don't have the right bacteria, your body is not going to break down that vegetation and therefore you're not going to get the same amount of nutrients. So it could be something as simple as bison bison who lived with bison antiquus, maybe evolutionary wise, they were able to uh, cultivate the necessary bacteria in their stomach to be able to break down and decompose the plants. And therefore they were a healthier species. Over time, malnutrition or an inability to get as much nutrition as you need will slowly eliminate the species. So it doesn't have to be predation necessarily. It can be something as simple as a climate change. What affected all of these animals? Probably climate change because when they were alive, it was a much cooler environment. And maybe they just weren't able to adapt to, let's say, a, uh, uh, a, a more modern environment. And maybe that's why those animals uh, died out. There's no way to know with absolute certainty because unfortunately things like that don't fossilize very often, if at all. So when I'm saying it could potentially be bacteria in the stomach, well, there's absolutely no way to prove that. Now, where I get that idea and I propose that hypothesis is looking at modern animals. Elephants are a prime example. One of the things that was noticed uh, years ago when people first started really looking at behavior hundreds of years ago, they noticed that baby elephants would eat the dung of their mother and people couldn't understand why. Well, later it was discovered that the dung is loaded with the bacteria necessary to decompose and break down that food. So the baby elephants are eating it because once they are weaned off of milk as their main diet... They have to go to eating plants and vegetation. They are already building up the necessary um, bacteria in their gut to be able to digest that. So maybe, um, again, maybe bison bison had a way of uh, cultivating the necessary bacteria. But again, I can't say that with any certainty because that doesn't fossilize. But by looking at modern animals like the elephant, using it as an example, that is at least founded in some sort of recognizable behavior and science to support it. So those are my best guesses. Maybe climate change had a great thing to do with it. Maybe um, uh, and when it comes to the short-faced bear, he was great for taking food away, but he may not have been as effective as catching food. If he was specialized in stealing food from, let's say, the saber-toothed cats, Well, maybe the saber-toothed cats went extinct because their food sources were too fast for them to keep up with. They couldn't keep up with them. Well, if this bear has made his living stealing from you and you're not here anymore, now I can't. It's like the bully who never brings money for lunch. If he can't beat you up and steal your lunch money, he goes hungry. Well, if that happens over and over again and you never come back to school because the bully won't leave you alone, the bully starves. 
So maybe the short-faced bear would have gone extinct for something like that. All right, uh, we're going to take a short break. I'm going to play a commercial to help pay the bills around here. And then when we come back, I will play you that interview with geologist uh, Devin Denny. Stick around because it's really, really good. Would you like to buy fossil replica skulls, teeth, claws, and more? Then visit our catalog at store.dinosaurgeorge.com. We sell replicas rather than real fossils so that we don't deplete the resources. Our replicas and casts are museum quality and look real, but are much more affordable. From dinosaurs to ice-aged mammals to modern animal skulls, there is something for everyone. Visit our online catalog at store.dinosaurgeorge.com and start your collection of amazing Amazing fossil replicas today. All right. The um, uh, the item that I want to highlight in this particular episode is one that I love. Uh, I had spoken briefly about saber tooth cats. This is item 5020. You can see it on my website, which is store.dinosaurgeorge.com. This is a tooth from a saber tooth cat called Homotherium. Now, it's not as big as Smilodon, but I like this a lot because it's very thin and very blade-like. This is a very, very cool tooth. It's, it measures about seven and a half inches on the outside curve. And what I mean by outside curve is if you take a tape measure and you measure the widest part, the longest part, it's seven and a half inches. From the tip to the base, it's probably closer to six and a half to seven. Uh, but this is really cool. So if you are a collector, uh, this is a replica, obviously. It retails for eight ninety five, so it's incredibly affordable. We ship worldwide. So if you are a collector and you'd like to add something different that you don't see very often, this would be a good piece, and I hope you'll consider buying it. All right, let's jump in now, and let's uh, play this interview that I did with Dr. Devin Denny. Um, it, it's great. So, so let's listen to it. Several years ago, I had the pleasure of meeting our guest and even had a short appearance in one of his films. Dr. Devin Denny has been a self-described broadcast geologist since 1999 and enjoys the creative freedom of educational filmmaking through Explorer Media Inc. That's a company he helped founded back in uh, uh, 2002. He's been an on-camera talent for several television and film projects, including North Texas Explorer, which was a TV show, Rock Hounds, the movie, that's a film, that's what I got to be in, that was kind of cool, and then Oklahoma Rocks, which is another film. This guy even does voiceover talent for other projects and serves as a researcher, co-producer, and writer, as well as a graphic consultant on multimedia projects. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce to you geologist Dr. Devin Denny. Dr. Denny, welcome to the show. Thank you, George. I appreciate you having me today. Boy, how long ago was that, that that we filmed that thing where I got to meet you? How long ago was that? You know, that was, it was a long time ago. Rock Hounds uh, was something that we did about 10 years ago. It's been almost a decade. Man. A long time. That is crazy. <laughs> I mean, how exciting. I'm sure, and, you know, you and I, I'm sure you and I both have done quite a bit since then, too. Well, no, I bet you we've passed each other probably 3,000 times going back and forth on the road between places. <laughs> probably so. You know, the, the world of broadcast paleontologists and geologists isn't that great, isn't that big. So. Well, that, yeah, that, that's exactly it. And, you know, it's, it's I, I just, I think it's so cool that you made the decision to kind of get into broadcast. But before we get that, let me, let me ask you, can you start off, uh, give us a little bit about information about you, who, you, who you are, you know, maybe your education, where you're from, that kind of stuff. Sure, you bet. Um, you know, I got started uh, doing geology many years ago. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in East Texas, and, you know, we didn't have much in the way of rocks out there. It was dirt and sand pretty much. And it was either black dirt or yellow dirt. Um, so I didn't know much about geology, um, but I had the opportunity to go on scholarship to the University of Oklahoma, and that, I really went on some field trips early. I had some really influential professors and took me out in the field and, and, and really opened my eyes. You know, the, the stories that uh, you can tell about the earth, uh, you know, things that are around you all of the all the time in your own backyard, you know, things that you take for granted, and that, you know, thought, if you will, has stuck with me through everything that, that we've ever done. I've, I've, from the very beginning, had this intense passion about uh, sharing those stories. I, I consider myself a bit of a storyteller, 
Um, and, you know, once you get me wound up, it's kind of hard to stop me. But, uh, you know, I, I leveraged it pretty early on uh, with uh, television and film. Uh, you know, I, I went from OU, I got my geology degree there at OU, and came down to Fort Worth, to Texas Christian University in Fort Worth. And I uh, was close to a childhood friend of mine, Todd Kent, who is the producer on much of what we do with Explore Multimedia. Uh, has done most of the videos that I've been involved in. And, uh, you know, I realized early on I had these stories to tell, and he had this talent for making videos. So, you know, it wasn't too long uh, before we started going out. Uh, we'd find a park. I'd find some science or something interesting about it. Maybe there was a rock outcrop that was you know, something cool was found in it or happened to it or it described some ancient environment that um, people didn't realize. People would drive by it every day going down the highway and just a rock, you know, rocks right. are boring. Uh, so, you know, how, how do you do that? Well, you go out and you stand in front of it and you tell this great story about all this cool stuff that happened millions of years ago. And people are like, whoa, really? <laughs> you know, I drive by that every day. And so we've kind of done that ever since. Well, that, that to me is amazing. To your point, the stories that the earth has to tell. And yet so many of us are so, t- especially today with, with technology, you know, we're, we're racing down the road and everybody in the car is looking at their phone, including the driver. (laughs) And we don't look out the window and notice that we're driving by sites of historical importance and yet we're missing it. So I'm kind of thrilled that, that that's what you focused on. That's what you do. And I met Todd who, who, you know, Todd became a friend as well. And that was what a great opportunity for you guys to hook up and do this. So a lot of what you learned in school, you then kind of talk about in your videos and sort of bring those those le- those those history historical moments to life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's kind of a feedback loop. And I, I from from Fort Worth, I'd started doing the videos, and you know they say you really learn something and truly grow passion around it when you teach it to someone else and through the videos really telling the stories and, and seeing the feedback and the reaction people had encouraged me to actually continue on with my own education so I, I went back to University of Oklahoma and, and started my PhD and got my doctorate there in geology and continued the whole time doing the uh, the videos and, and it was through that period of time you know in, in North Texas we had a the television show you referenced, uh, it was it was a funny thing, actually. Um, Todd was at the University of North Texas, and he was, you know, like a, a director on their local UNT TV station. And, um, you know, we would, we would throw the video on at 3 in the morning, you know, and I guess uh, the folks are coming back, uh, you know, hung over from the bars or whatever, and they're watching our show that they're playing overnight, and we'd get emails and all sorts of feedback from it. So... Well, that grew. We started uh, populating other stations around Texas. We were on, at our maximum, about 14 different stations wow. from Louisiana to New Mexico, uh, several uh, several across Texas. And so we had kind of a little regional television show there. And when I made the decision to go back to uh, OU to further my education, we, we, we switched from television mode to documentary mode. That's kind of where you came in, you know, the Rock Hounds being our, our first drill documentary that we did in our post North Texas Explorer phase. Um, you know, I, I will also say a little bit about the, the stories and, you know, you, you hit on something there that I could probably talk for 10 minutes on. And that is, you know, in the old days, I'll, I'll say old days, uh, you know, kids did things like play in the dirt, uh, you know, piles of sand, skipping rocks on ponds. You know, we had this relationship with the earth that was foundational. Um, you, know, you know, part of your education about the earth was going out and interacting with it. Uh, one of the things that I really gather from, from, from current kids and things that, that really needs is we've got to find a way to weave more of those tangible, real experiences in with their the education that they get. They, they consume torrents of information through iPads and through computers and Minecraft and, you know, videos on YouTube. But what they lack is that sort of real, tangible right. experience that goes with it. So, you know, a lot of what we're doing today, kind of looking forward for us, is how we can can put forth programs that do both. You know, right? Let's let's give people videos and and give people uh, 
the the information in a sort of scientific method based way of thinking, and then let them give them physical rocks and fossils that they can touch and and take them on virtual field trips and you know get them exposed to all that. So you know we're we're neck deep in that right now going forward. Good, and and you're absolutely right. It can, it, it absolutely is great to read about a subject or view a video about a subject. But when you're dealing in something like geology to, to pick up some of the different rock specimens and be able to understand what, how that rock was formed, where it came from, what it is. I think that just makes the study of uh, makes the, makes geology come to life. It's like paleontology. It's wonderful. It's great to read about it. But when you put your hands on a fossil, you're holding a piece of history. Well, it's the exact same thing with geology. Oh, absolutely. And the two are the two are intimately related. You know, I, I, I have a great piece of sandstone that has a, uh, some shells and fossils in it, and it's maybe 20, 30 million year old shell. And it looks like it's something that you would walk down to the beach and pick up. It's all consolidated now and cemented up. It's a rock with fossils in it. I show it to the kids, and the kids are like, oh, you know, that looks just like what's down at the beach. And I tell them, well, it was actually found in a mountain. Right. You know, it was found in a mountain in the middle of the country at about 9,000 feet elevation. <laughs> so that's about as far away from a beach as you could possibly be. <laughs> yet, truly, you look at it, and it's a beach. It's it's a beach in a rock. Right. And so how, how do the two meet? You know, and. And then you can tell that story of you know, ancient oceans and all these cool things. That, you know, kids' eyes just like that. Oh, they're, yeah. They're, their eyes get big, and they're like, whoa, you yeah. know, <laughs> cool. Well, you, you had touched on that. You went back, and you got your doctorate. And, and so um, I, since I know you personally, and, and I, you know, I, I've known you, is it okay just to call you Devin? Would that be okay? Oh, sure, absolutely. Okay. Well, well for all of the, the viewers and listeners, the reason why I asked – uh, because I know Devin personally, but when somebody goes and gets their doctor and they earn the degree and they earn the title of doctor, uh, it is a tremendous amount of work to do that. And it's very important that the way you, you recognize and, and show respect for the work they put in, you would refer to, to Devin as you would recur, refer to him as Dr. Denny. Uh, and so, I just want all you young folks to know that if you see Dr. Denny somewhere, you don't walk up and say, hey, Devin, what's happening? I mean, I understand that, that you know, we're friends and that sort of stuff. But again, I find it very important that people that go through the amount of work you went through and others have gone through to earn that degree, you should at least start the conversation. And then if, if uh, you know, if, if you felt comfortable saying, oh, you know, just, just call me Devin or Dev, whatever you, whatever you go by, sure. then that's fine. But I just want to make sure, can you touch a little bit about what kind of work it took? The, what's the difference between you got your degree and then you went back and got your doctor? What kind of goes into that? Well, you know, it, it, you know, and I appreciate what you said about, about, um, you know, the title of doctor, you, you do earn it. it it's, it's a, amount of time and effort that you put in um, you know and, and, and many colleges do it differently um, I, I ended up I went to school for 10 years maybe 11 years total so wow. you know I, you put in your three or four years to get a bachelor's degree and then you go uh, and do a master's degree which is sort of the professional degree so if you wanted to go into mining or oil and gas or any number of professional entry level positions in geology, you'd need a, a master's degree, another two years. And then the doctorate is really, it's intended to be a research degree. So many people that want to go and become professors, uh, they could be eligible to teach at university uh, or, or have research and development type positions, uh, will go and they'll get a PhD. I got a PhD for a different reason. To me, I'm one of those guys, it's like, if there's a mountain, then I need to go climb it. And I would have felt bad if I hadn't carried my education as far as I could, um, because I just love to learn. And, and when you love to learn, it's kind of hard to stop. You know, that next that next degree is out there. That next level of, of learning and thinking and knowing is out there. And so, I mean, I, I would I would say to any kids out there listening or adults for that matter, you know, it's a long hard road. You know, you learn a lot about yourself and. 
and how to to take on research projects that are that are long and and sometimes with sometimes with science you know science is um you know you're dealing with data and you're dealing with data that's imperfect and often not the da- data that you need to tell the story that that you think you are trying to tell so a lot of that time that's spent in those you know four or five years that you spend doing a doctorate is really spent uh, doing the detective work, you know, going out and gathering data. And sometimes data is, is expensive and, and difficult to get. And maybe it's hard to get. Um, my, my PhD, I actually did my dissertation on uh, paleomagnetism, which is kind of an interesting twist. Um, you know, so while I was looking at ancient mag- magnetic fields that are stored or frozen into the rocks when they form, and what that does is it helps us understand uh, you know, when those rocks formed, what the age of those rocks were, and, and a little bit about the planet at the time, you know, where, where the poles were and where the continents were located. So there's a there's an aspect of the geography of the ancient Earth, which I've always been fascinated with, is what did the Earth look like, you know, right. 150, 200 million years ago? Where were the oceans at? Where were the mountains at? You know, where was the continent at? Um, you know, if you go online, you can see some really fantastic maps by a couple of guys, um, uh, Blakey in uh, uh, northern Arizona and then uh, Chris Keys down at, at uh, Arlington UTA. They make these beautiful renderings of ancient Earth. And a lot of that data is data like what I use on my Ph.D. So, uh, uh, you know, that's a, kind of a part of it. But it's so it's been a journey. You know, certainly a journey worth anyone doing. I think everybody's is a little different, but um, you know, it, it is it is something you earn. You know, for sure. Right. Well, for some folks, they don't maybe don't understand how geology really impacts uh, life every day. You know, for the average mm-hmm. person, they they understand paleontology because somebody goes out, they dig up a bone, they put it in a museum. I can go look at a museum. But that's not always the case with geology. I think some people who are unfamiliar with the science, can you kind of give our listeners a little bit of information about how geology maybe impacts their lives every day? Sure, yeah. Well, you know, it's it's such a broad question because, um, and it, it absolutely does. You're absolutely right. It, it affects us in many, many ways, um, you know, at the very at the very lowest level, or excuse me, at the very highest level, you know, I mean, everything we do is on the Earth, you know, and so the study of the Earth, the study of Earth systems, we are a part of those systems. We're sort of dynamically connected to our planet. Right. Um, so, you know, everything, you know, you hear about all sorts of things in the news. You know, you hear about energy and natural resources. You hear about climate change. You hear about earthquakes and volcanoes and all of these different things uh, that impact our lives, just just a large scale. But what what fascinates me is the things that affect us on on a very local scale. Uh, You know, one of the things that you'll see in all of our videos is this really sort of backyard feel because, you know, I, you know, I grew up, I'll just give you an example of what I'm talking about. I grew up out in, in the country and not too far from Dallas. And there were some creeks and streams running through the, the area around where I lived. And I would explore those. And, you know, it turns out that there are real reasons why those are located where they are. Maybe maybe a river flows through an area because there's a particular rock there. And that particular rock is very easily erodible because it's a shale or it contains some mud that was a part of some ancient floodplain or the part of some ancient sea okay. And those rocks come through in just that location because 200 million years ago, two continents collided and those rocks were uplifted, right? And that particular spot happened to be where those particular rocks were exposed and eroded, and that's where our our river flows. So it's almost like like the Kevin Bacon game, you know, through time, where, you know, one thing is related to another is related to another. Um, And that's what I find so fascinating about it. it. you can find countless ways to describe how geology affects our lives. But, right. you know, you look at things like um, natural resources. Uh, you know, we, we look at rocks as, as, a, as a petroleum geologist. We look at rocks and understand the rocks and understand where the rocks formed uh, 
uh, oil and gas source, right? So, so organics and the organics get cooked into oil and gas, and we go look for oil and gas. And from that oil and gas, there are thousands and thousands of products that are made. The plastic on the telephone that I'm talking to you on right now, right? Um, those, I mean, everything you know comes from from oil and gas or mineral deposits. Right. So it's it's it, it surrounds us. It, it permeates us. Right. Really. Well, if it wasn't for a geologist's understanding of the the makeup of rocks, our homes that we build, the roads that we drive on, um, you can't just go out and pick a rock and think this would make a good house. You you have to have somebody who understands how much pressure that rock can take. What it like sandstone would not be a good building block, I would suspect to make a home out of sandstone, right? Yeah, yeah, well, it would have probably erode here in a few years. Right. No, you know, and, or break. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, there's a reason why the limestones are commonly used in, uh, in buildings. They're very strong. You know, they right. have a high compressive strength, right? So shales aren't used because they, they fall apart, you know, right. and they weather very quickly. So, you don't want something like that protecting you from the elements. Right. It won't last very long. <laughs> and it has no strength. So, yeah, there's a there's a, a, a tremendous amount of engineering connection to geology. Uh, if you are the city or the high, or the federal government and you want to build a highway, you know, you bring out engineers to study the geology. There's a whole part of, of, of uh, a whole discipline called geological engineering that is exactly what you're describing where can we put this road? Where can we put this, this house or this building right. uh, where it's stable, you know, so it won't fall over once we get it 10 stories up. Um, right. That, yeah. So lots of cool stuff like that. Oh yeah. So you've had the chance to, to travel all over the country and look at some of the different formations. And obviously most people, when they think of an amazing formation, it would be something like the grand Canyon, which, you know, what a great opportunity to see a slice of the earth. But can you talk about some of the things and places you've been, even if they may not be as grand as the Grand Canyon, places that you think have either a magnificent story or something really amazing that happened there? Yeah, I, there are so many, so many that come to mind. I'll tell you, I, I can tell you the first time I ever took a trip to the mountains with my parents was the Yellowstone National Park. Oh, God, and Yellowstone is, is, is one of, it's like the grand cathedral of geology to me, just <laughs> right. because it, it's, uh, you know, it, it, there's so much, it's, it, the world is dynamic and it's always changing. You know, even, even when you're sitting still in a quiet room, believe it or not, the continent under your feet is moving, you know, it, right. it's moving to two millimeters a year, right? As fast as your fingernail grows. So you know, it, it's never standing still, but at Yellowstone, everything moves. You know, that, that the geysers and the, the springs and rocks that are being born. I think the other the other thing that really stands out in my mind is going to Hawaii to the Kilauean volcano and, and standing there uh, with the lava flows and watching rocks be born. It's it's like a, a geologic nursery. What a great um, description. <laughs> what a great yeah, description. It, it, fantastic experience and i mean those places like that the grand King, yellowstone kilauea nor you know, the united states in particular is just absolutely blessed with these unbelievable places uh you know it's and, and so in the density of the the natural beauty of it and, and the stories that we have tell is is fantastic I, I don't know if i can pick any one um in particular that i like but those two are pretty high on my list Right. Um, I, I will tell you one more story real quick. Um, I have had the chance to go outside of North America quite a bit as well, and uh, to uh, Europe and to uh, uh, Mexico. And, and one particular place that, that was probably uh, the most unique place I've ever been was down to a, a very famous mine. It's called the Nica Mine uh, near Chihuahua, Mexico. And in that mine, there were a series of caves. And those caves became famous. Uh, they were in National Geographic. And this was back in the 90s, after not too long after the caves had been discovered. Right. Uh, but the, it was in an active zinc and molybdenum mine, and you had to drive down a road into this active mine in Mexico about a mile deep. 
and there were there were giant caves full of crystals of uh, mineral selenite, which is a, a variety of gypsum. And these crystals were the size of automobiles. I okay, now I know what you're talking pictures. about. Right. Yeah. If, if you, you see, actually, the deepest part of the cave is so hot that you have to wear uh, protective suits in order to get into it. Um, so you see these beautiful pictures on, on National Geographic and right. these, this giant cave with these massive crystals. And to be able to go, we were one of the, the very few. It's not open to the public, and now it actually is now full of water. They've let that cave actually fill back up. It's a hydrothermal system and they had to pump the water off. So they put the water back on to let the minerals keep growing. They're actively growing today. So and that was a spectacular, spectacular experience. Yeah, that's, that's, the that's the place that looked like giant columns the size of trees, yes. like a forest made of crystals, right? That's right. Oh, yeah, my God. Absolutely. And you got to see just, that? You got to see them? Yeah, we did. Oh, good Lord. We, we, the, we, we got to see those, uh, and it was, it was, I can't, can't say uh, more about it. It was, it was, it was amazing. You know, the water there, when you drive down, you're in an active hydrothermal system, which means boiling water moving through the rocks around you. Um, and so you had fractures in the floor where water would actually boil through the, into the space you're in. The, uh, the the air temperature was around 140 degrees plus oh. or minus, so it would have been something <laughs> like a, a hot sauna. Right. So there was a limit to how long you could stay down there just because, you know, you'd start to kind of cook, you know, if you right. stay down there too long. But these, uh, these folks were down there driving equipment, and they were mining this beautiful, the actual mine itself uh, was a football field-sized cavern that looked like a giant, the biggest geode that you'll ever see in your life. Really? It just sparkled as far as the eye could see. It was just spectacular. My God, there is no artist on the planet that can do the natural beauty that nature can do. Absolutely true. Wow. That is, that's, yeah. oh, that's cool. Well, let me throw a, a hypothetical out for you. For for the average person that's driving down the road, here in Texas, we see a lot of it, where they cut through the side of a hill to make the highway. And you're looking out the window and you see this wall, let's just say a sheer 40-foot wall of rock, and you see these various layers in it. Something that always, and I recognize the various labor layers could mean different time periods, something apparently big happened. But then you see some of them that look like, instead of all being perfectly straight, the way you'd expect the layers to be, like pages in a book, all of a sudden you see like a big hump where all of the layers look like something thrust up and move them all. I mean, I realize that's hypothetical, but what in the heck could cause something like that? Well, you do see a lot of, you know, I, I mentioned before, that you know the earth is actually very dynamic and you know what, what's interesting is is if you really wanted to look at the a layer of rock let's say you went up to a rock outcrop next to the highway and and you're looking at the layers of rock and yes the layers represent different times when rock was being deposited um, in various conditions so if you use modern environments to compare it to we would talk about oceans we would talk about lakes maybe we even talk about the flanks of big mountains where, you know, a lot of debris is being shed off and deposited. So there's lots of different ways. But the actual time, the most of the time in Earth's history is that caught up between those layers. It's when very little's happening, you know, or erosion is happening. And so there's a tremendous amount of time represented by layers of rock and, and, and much more so than the actual layers suggest. And, you know, in those intermediate times, things happen. You know, like uh, here in North America, Oklahoma and Texas is a great example. Uh, you know, back in the Pennsylvanian period of time, um, there was a massive collision between the North American Laurentian uh, continent and then uh, what would have been uh, Andwana, uh or sort of South America, Africa, slash the south side of, of North America, creating... The Arbuckle Mountains in Oklahoma, which is one of the oldest mountain ranges in in uh, the U.S., and then as a part of that, also the 
the uh, the Wachita uh, Appalachian. So the Appalachian Mountains all formed at that time. So you know, you, it's it's like a slow motion locomotive crashing into another locomotive over several millions of years. They have a lot of momentum and a lot of mass. And when those things hit, those flat rocks, they're not flat anymore. They, uh, at the time, may have been buried 20,000, 10,000 feet deep under high temperature and pressure. And the rocks don't behave like they do at the surface. They're very brittle and, and they break at the surface. But when they're deep underground, they're hot and they, it's kind of like toothpaste. You know, they just kind of bend under the heat and the pressure. So eventually the rocks are uplifted as those mountains grow up and those continents collide. And in the intervening 200 million years, the erosion has stripped a lot of that rock away and exposed those deep rocks that are very folded up and broken up, and they look really wild. That is, you know, that is the first time somebody has ever explained. Because, see, the explanation I've received in the past has been, well, that represents a, you know, an uplifting of, of tectonic plates and that kind of stuff. But it's, it, it's, now that you've described the fact that the rocks were in a semi-fluid state, it makes mm-hmm. more sense that you see that that bulge. Because when, when the average person looks at it, my first thought would be, why didn't it just all break like like the way you'd expect right. it to break? Why is it curved? Why are the lines so smooth and f- almost flowing looking? But it never dawned yeah. on me that that occurred when that mass was way underground and it's taken all this time to come up to the surface and bring with it that moment when it was fluid. Now it's just become solidified, right? That's right. Yeah. And you know, rocks, rocks break at the surface, but they tend to just break and make faults, you know, we right. see faults where they're just kind of broken. Right. But yeah. The, the more, the deeper and the hotter it was, sometimes the more mangled those rocks get. When you go to the, the core of mountain ranges, the really old rocks that have been buried really deep. And, and the Arbuckles is a pretty good place to see this, actually, because the Arbuckles, are, if you're familiar, uh, it's a little bitty mountain range, a little hilly range uh, just north of uh, the Texas border. And when you drive through, there's spectacular road cuts uh, through the Arbuckle Mountains. And it was purposeful, actually, because people wanted to see the rocks in the Arbuckles because we were actually searching for oil and gas in Oklahoma and the exact same rocks in the deep base where they're 40,000 feet deep. So you can see them at the surface there. And it turns out it's uh, the, the Arboca Mountains, when you really look at it from the side, it's a giant carpet roll. And so not only were the deep rocks uplifted, but they were uplifted into a, a big sort of upside down U shape. And then they rolled completely upside down on one side. So there's a part of the Arctic Mountains that is completely inverted so that it's normally the oldest rocks are on bottom. Right. That's a, a principle in geology. Uh, in the case of the Arbuckles, at least in one part of them, the young, the oldest rocks are on top and the youngest rocks are on, on the bottom. So it's, it's really fascinating just the amount of torture these rocks have gone under. How insane. You know, yeah. we, we see a flood how quickly a flood can change the terrain of say a stream or a riverbed or something like that um we saw it in canyon lake when that uh did did you ever get a chance to see that that magnificent um uh near the spillway i guess there was a huge flood maybe in 97 98 and it carved out this magnificent uh uh what's the word i'm looking for uh kind of a, a, a valley thing, but it was magnificent mm-hmm. and it occurred in the span of a couple of weeks. And so you look at that and you go, holy cow, these kind of changes can occur in a short amount of time, but those only affect a small area. You look at what we're looking at or what you're, you're talking about. What kind of force does it take to turn a mountain upside down? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's the that's the cool thing about about geology is that it occurs. It, it's it's almost like a, if you're familiar with the, the concept of fractals in nature. So some some things like the the shape on some ammonite shells, right, where you have 
shapes at very small scales that occur again at larger scales and then occur again at really big scales. Uh, there's a lot of that in nature. It's just natural phenomenon. It's, it's like if I zoomed in on a mountain on one rock, the shape of one rock would imitate the shape of the entire mountain, right? Right. And so it's, there's a lot of that in geology where, you know, I can see daily changes in some streams, you know, and maybe over a hundred years, I can see a similar change in this entire river valley. And maybe in a thousand years, I can actually move that river valley across a large area. You know, I give you a good example. This is really uh, pertinent, too, in Louisiana. And Louisiana sits on the Mississippi River Delta. And for thousands, millions of years, the Mississippi River has been dumping silt uh, out of the central part of the United States into the Gulf of Mexico. And as it piles up that sand over time, what happens is, the, the, the delta gets higher and higher until the slope gets almost zero. And so at that point, water it likes to flow downhill. It will look for the another path. And we have a, as a process called avulsion, where the entire river delta will actually move. And it's moved back and forth along that coast in Louisiana for, for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. And right now, the river delta sits sort of southeast of New Orleans, and it's actually wanting to move. It desperately wants to fill an area called the Atchafalaya Swamp, which is just to the west, which is a low. And the Corps of Engineers, and the United States Corps of Engineers, has actually set up an entire facility and site to prevent that from happening. And the reason why is the entire city of New Orleans would sink into the ocean. Oh, my God. They allowed that to naturally occur because that, that supply of sediment and water and sand would then be rerouted. And, of course, the flood would be terrific for people that live in the, in the, the south side of Louisiana as well. So it, it, it's, it's amazing those kinds of things, you know, that, it, it, that the story is that, uh, you know, just how geology overnight, you know, one massive flood or one earthquake or something could change the course of a river like the Mississippi overnight. It's theoretically possible. We've had major earthquakes on the Mississippi before, right. the New Madrid earthquake. And so if something like that could happen, it could absolutely rearrange the geography of the entire state of Louisiana for for millions of years, and it could happen overnight. Wow. So it, it's it's pretty astounding when you think about stories like that. God. Yeah, well, you, well, you look at things like when Mount St. Helen erupts, and, and you get a— I'm sure from a geology standpoint, th those kind of things are absolutely the greatest educational thing you can see because you can see firsthand exactly what happens. And then I guess you would take the knowledge you have of how things formed in the past and maybe be able to compare the two to say, you know, what I thought took millions of years might have taken a few days or what I thought took a few days, this proves exactly how that could occur in the span of a short time, right? Sure. No, absolutely. I, you know, geologists use use modern observations, modern systems, you know, the data we can collect in order to infer you know, what the past might have been like. So, right. if, I mean, to use your example of Mount St. Helens, uh, we learned a lot from Mount St. Helens about the way these uh, lahars and these mud flows and just the way that that volcano started its volcanic cycle and, and the way it blew itself apart, you know, the, the, all of the different mechanics of how that happened. We learned a lot about, about that type of volcano. And, you know, I mean, the fact is that there were hundreds of feet of mud and ash that were deposited. And that's a big layer of rock, you know, if you right. allow that to, the bury and then become rock. That's, that's a lot of rock that was laid down in a short period of time. And so, yeah, you go back and you change your model, right? You look back at some rocks, um, you know, volcanic rocks from 300 million years ago and then question, Hey, you know, maybe, um, you know, maybe this, this was a, a different type of environment or a different system than I thought it was. You know? right. and so you, you constantly challenge yourself that way. Well, I, I, I guess the one thing that, all geologists and paleontologists always talk about is we look, well, paleontology, we're looking at millions. You guys are looking at billions as far as years. <laughs> so, sure, yeah. so yeah, you, you know, I, 
Well, I, I will tell you that things get a lot less interesting after about 550 million years ago because when you get prior to the, the, the fossil record, prior to the Cambrian explosion where there was, you know, a tremendous amount of life, explosion of life, uh, you know, it was a it was a pretty rocky, barren, boring planet, quite frankly. You know, right. um, I, I tell people about some of the old rocks and what the world might have been like. You know, it was windy and desolate, and and pretty lonely, right? Right. <laughs> Way back then. <laughs> uh, not that the Earth wasn't still moving and driving and doing all sorts of things, but right. uh, things really get interesting when you bring fossils into the record too. Oh, absolutely, and and that's that's the thing that I think. So many people in paleontology, young folks wanting to get into paleontology, sometimes don't understand how important geology is to paleontology. Because I can't just walk out in my backyard and hope to find a Tyrannosaurus rex. I have to understand the age of the formations and in some cases how they were formed. Because if I go to a place where it's nothing but... um, uh, I mean, it's all sedimentary rock. My chances of finding a fossil increase. If I go to a place where it's metamorphic rock or igneous, I, I'm not going to find much at all. So you guys play a huge role for paleontology because if we don't understand what it is you guys understand, maybe not to the same degree. Like, I mean, I can I can look at a, a formation and if it's if it's sandstone or mudstone, I can identify that. But if it wasn't for you guys explaining that part of the story, People who want to dig fossils need to learn your story because otherwise you have no idea where to go. Sure, yeah, and even beyond sedimentary versus igneous, understanding, hey, you know, in order to find these fossils, I need to find places where there was a system that would have preserved those fossils. So right. you know, maybe I'm in a shoreline system, you know, on a beach. You know, maybe that was buried in mud and I could have, preserved some footprints or you know maybe i was in a floodplain so just understanding what those ancient environments were like you know will help you refine where it is to look so that those bones may have been preserved for you to find right, right. so all of that stuff is, is fascinating to, to to try and figure out you know when you look at when you look at a sedimentary rock and you see a fossil or you see a mineral or you know or, or it could be many things could be a, a piece of an old plant you know I, I i was looking at a rock the other day and i i, I pulled it apart and there was a beautiful fern thought frond oh, wow. you know sitting there almost perfectly preserved fern you know and, and, and it's very very delicate and to think about you know under what conditions could that fern have been preserved so perfectly you know right. it's very quiet water um you know probably very little oxygen in the water you know that would have kept it there from kept it from breaking down you right. know, for a while. So it, you can start to put those pieces back together. And then what does that little fern tell you about the world at that time or the part of the world you were in? Were you in a swamp or, you know, was this an area, was this a period of time, you know, when ferns dominated, you know, back in the, in the Carboniferous or, uh, or, or, or prior to that. So uh, you, you, it's great. It's a great old detective story. Right. Well, as all good stories, it takes the right person to tell the story and to explain it in a manner that anyone, whether it's children or adult can understand. And that leads me to your filming and videos. They are the best educational lesson for anyone. I'm serious. They are absolutely incredible Uh, for all of you guys that, that are listening. And I, everybody understands when I say guys, I'm talking about people, not, women or men um it is um you have got to go to the website to be able to see some of the various videos that you have on there and of course on your website you've got links to you know to all the different uh uh all all your different uh social media and that kind of stuff um your website is devindenny.com right well, that's one of them. We've got we've got a number of, of websites uh, that you can go to, and you can link to any of the materials that we've produced. Uh, DevonDenny.com is sort of a, a bio page about me. Right. Uh, you can go to uh, Geology. Uh, our our company is Explore Multimedia. Right. So, um, uh, you can go there to learn a bit more about the company. 
Uh, all of our videos can be found linked through, I, well, first of all, um, if you go uh, at Geology Video on any social media, you can find our stuff. Right. Uh, geologyvideo.com uh, is out there, and you can link to all of our North Texas Explorer uh, episodes. You can link to all of our, our, our rock albums, the movie, our Oklahoma Rocks. You can see that our, we had a geo road trip series that we've done for several years where it's basically a field trip that we do every summer, uh, taking folks out to some of these places like uh, we discussed, Grand Canyon and Death Valley, some of those types of places. Uh, and then, of course, uh, here recently in the last few years, we've been doing a YouTube series. So you can go to YouTube, search for Devin Denny, um, or or, um, or our, our series that we have been really focused on. It's called Geology Kitchen. And Geology Kitchen sounds weird because it's geology and it's kitchen. People don't normally put the two together. But what we realized was a great way to, to teach geology and the underlying science was through food. You know, a lot of the physics and chemistry and, and the way we combine things and processes, all you can you can do them in the kitchen. And it helps bring people into what's really going on. You know, when we talk about how a sedimentary rock is made, well, I can show you, I can demonstrate it using food. And so that's been a real popular uh, series for us here in the last few years. <laughs> That's well, the I'm looking right now at explore multimedia.org uh, for everybody out there. E X P L O E, I mean, R E R M U L T I M E D I A dot org. I'll put a link on my podcast page to this page uh, because, yeah, this has all of your videos, it has links to your Facebook, links to YouTube, and to Twitter. Um, it's got all of the various videos. It even has an online store where if you guys want to buy some of these things, um, they're all available for you to do that too. So, right. So Devin is a, is sort of a, um, like I said, it lists your bio and all your information, uh, press, uh, all the different things that you've done, but there's also a link there as well that takes you to explore multimedia uh, Inc. and it'll take you there, uh, plus all of your other contacts. So the the video, uh, to me, I find it fascinating to look at all of the different videos that and very popular videos, videos too, on YouTube. Um, it is so great of you to do those kind of educational things. Well, what is it like to make those? Do you, do you just randomly choose a a um, uh, a subject or can people write to you and say, Hey, can you do X, Y, Z? How, how do you decide to do that? You know, usually with, with geology kitchen, it's been, um, we'll, we'll find a good, uh, thing to do in the kitchen and then we'll work our way backwards into the geology. So, um, you know, we just recently did a new, a new one that we haven't even posted yet. We, we, we wanted to show how waterfalls are made, right? So, wow. You know, I made a cake, and we made a bunch of different layers, and the different layers had different properties. We had a layer of brownie, we had a layer of cake, a layer of ice cream, and a layer of sugar. And each one was chosen because of the way that it interacted with water. Some were very soft, so when you get them wet, they fall apart, just like some rocks do. Some were very resilient and didn't react with water at all. And so we built a layer cake model of an area, and we poured water on it and showed how that water actually eroded the the cake and the, the physics behind it is very similar to what really happens in, in the real world so you know that way we just kind of came up with it based on hey here, here's a, a thing that we want to uh, to teach to show let's find a clever kind of cool way to integrate it with something in the kitchen so that you know ted wants to to watch this and sort you know, I, I'd like to do that in my own kitchen. I don't have to have a bunch of fancy chemicals and stuff to do science. I can do it with food in their own in their own home. Matter of fact, probably one of the biggest um, uh, compliments I think that we've gotten from all of what we did was the fact that teachers have been using Geology Kitchen in their classrooms. Wow! And YouTube will actually allow you to build playlists of videos and uh, several teachers have actually asked their students to go make their own versions of geology kitchen and it's fantastic 
when you watch a, a child imitate you online by doing another version of your show, you know, and, and th- that, that is just great. That's what it's all about because it means that they're really engaged with what they're seeing that they want to copy it, you know. Right. Uh, imitation is a, the highest form of flattery. So, oh, truly. Um, it, 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 that part of it's excellent. So, yeah, I mean, you know, we've it, it's always been a labor of love for us to kind of go out and do these videos. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun. You know, so we really, we've really up until this point just kind of done things that, that we want to do. Um, you know, it's it's not a not a, a day job for me. I don't require a, a certain um, type of video and, and, and a certain topic. You know, we don't have to do them uh, all the time. So we just pick and choose what we want to do. And, and, and teachers do give us feedback and say, hey, you know, we'd really like more of this and we'd really like more of that. And we're actually working on you know, a new program where we're hoping to take Geology Kitchen and the concept and actually put it together with the field trip uh, videos that we've done in Oklahoma Rocks and in Rock Hills. Right. And create something even new, something that combines the best of both worlds. Uh, And that's something that that we're excited about and we're, we're working on starting up right now, as a matter of fact. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm right now, as we're talking, I'm jumping around on YouTube looking at at the Geology Kitchen, the Geo Walks, Oklahoma Rocks. This, this is the, I really, really like the Geology Kitchen because what a, what a great way to, to make sense of it to a young person, just like your description of waterfalls. Most of us look at a waterfall and go, wow, that's beautiful, and you just make the assumption water just fell off of a hill. And you don't put a lot of knowledge or we don't, we don't put a lot of thought into how did that water make it there in the first place? Because way back in the, earlier in the in the interview, you made the comment about, you know, a stream is formed when the water looks for the lowest place. And if the rock that it chooses dissolves, it makes it deeper and makes it more likely the water continues to go there. Well, even that is a great analogy. But by using a kitchen and food as a way to make your point, I think that's absolutely genius. That. That should be shown in every in every school in every classroom that studies rocks. This should be a must. Yeah, that, that's that's. I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that. That's exactly what we're trying to do right now. Is is you know we're, we're seeking some corporate sponsorship to to try and put um, geology kitchen into every school uh, as a tool. You know, right. provide it for teachers. Teachers um, are more and more STEM topics are being asked by the states, you know, right. to be included. But a lot of the teachers don't have the uh, the knowledge or the skills. They haven't built those skills yet to teach things like earth science. So it's a little bit, um, it's a little difficult for them sometimes if they don't have tools to do it. And right. so uh, you know, I'm, I'm actually on the board of directors of a foundation here in Oklahoma called the Oklahoma Geological Foundation. And I'm their STEM coordinator. And um, I, I am reaching out looking for ways as through our videos to try and provide teachers uh, across the board with more things like Geology Kitchen where they can show them in their classrooms and it will engage them to start having conversations around earth science and, and geology. So right. that part of uh, what I'm doing yeah. right now is, is it's really great. I mean, we're really excited about, about getting this into more, more and more schools. Well, I, any, any, anybody out there who is a teacher, an educator who is listening, um, I, I would suggest going first to uh, devindenny.com, D-E-V-I-N-D-E-N-N-I-E.com, because from there it takes you to everywhere, uh, Explore Multimedia Inc. All, it has all of, your, all of your connections. So go to that one because when you go to devindenny.com, I happen to notice right on your homepage, First, there's this funny looking man in a hat cooking something, but there is something new that you just mm-hmm. released. What is that? Tell us what you've done. That is, uh, that would be um, a new book. Um, offer, I authored my first uh, commercial book uh, through uh, Dorling Kindersley DK Publishing out of London. They're a part of uh, Penguin Random Health. Uh, this is a, a book called My Book of Rocks and Minerals, and it, it's a very simple, very beautiful book. Uh, it's got 
be pictures in it, but it's really intended for um, uh, kids, you know, around six, seven, eight, nine years old that really just are, are beginning to learn about the world and learn about rocks, minerals, and fossils. So we wanted a really simple book that the kids could go in and flip through and see some some pretty pictures and learn a few a few little facts about them. Not very intimidating. Uh, and, and that uh, we 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 did that. We worked on that um, you know, over the winter, and we just came out in July. Uh, you can get it on Amazon.com or or DK.com or any number of places, Barnes and Noble. Uh, it's, it's on sale now, and we're really proud of it. It's a great looking um, great looking book, and, and the price is right too. It's it's for for a hundred page uh, beautiful reference book. Um, you know, it's about twelve bucks. So I uh, can't beat it. Boy, you're not kidding. Yeah, I'm looking at it on uh, on Amazon. If you go to Amazon, the title is My Book of Rocks and Minerals, uh, but you can also search through Devin Denny, uh, the off- author. And uh, by the way, you, you've you received a uh, uh, five-star rating, so congratulations. When you go to devindenny.com, you'll see it on the homepage page. Uh, there's a link to it. The minute you click on it, it takes you right to Amazon. You can order your copy there. If you or somebody you know loves rocks and minerals, it, it the, just the cover alone looks to be a beautiful, beautiful book. And, of course, all of his connections, all of his links are on that page. Uh, go to Explore Multimedia, Inc. That has links to Facebook and to YouTube to watch some of those videos. If you are somebody that just likes rocks and minerals, and you would like an opportunity to understand more of the story that they have to tell. Yes, it's great to pick up a cat's eye and look at or a tiger eye and look at it and go, man, that's beautiful. But to learn more about geology, I absolutely recommend you go and you look at the videos these guys are producing. Um, go on, Go on their website. There's so much there to see and learn. And... I am so incredibly proud to see the work you and Todd and your group is doing to try to bring more education, a, a fun way to learn. I, I'm I'm just absolutely honored that I got the chance to meet you 10 years ago and that you continue to do so well. It's, it's very exciting to see that going on. Well, I appreciate that, Georgia. Uh, you know, you're you're doing a lot of great things yourself too, uh, in the in the paleo world for us uh, to to try and educate kids as well. And I'm, I'm, I I track you as well through the. That's the beauty of the internet nowadays, yeah. right? Yeah. We've got to keep tabs on each other and what we're doing. Absolutely. So, uh, right. You know, I, it, it, we got to keep that 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 um, broadcast geo paleo network tight. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, for everybody out there, uh, Dr. Uh, Devin Denny is a geologist and a host of a, of a, audio, a video series, a variety of videos that are very educational, fun. You've taught us just a ton in just the short amount of time that we've had you on to hear some of these stories. I would love, if we could, to set up a future date to maybe um, maybe go into greater detail about some of the things that say some of our listeners could go out and look for and in road cuts or places that they have access to. And maybe you could give a lesson on what it is they should be looking at and then maybe how to read into some of that, man. I think that'd be a lot of fun to do that. Sure. Yeah, no, that'd be great. That's something I enjoy doing. You know, I I think anything that we can do to get people excited about the subject and, and to go out and, and, to places like that and see them in a different light, you know, Hey, at any time you just, you just give me a holler, man, we'll set up a time. Well, go, go to his website, follow him on Facebook and Twitter and read the blog and watch the videos and go to explore multimedia and get more information about, uh, about Dr. Uh, Devin Denny. What a pleasure. What a great pleasure to talk to you. It has been so much fun. I, I hope we can have you back again. Absolutely, George. I appreciate the invite. All right, man. Take care. (laughs) Bye-bye. All right, you guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed 
that interview with Dr. Devin Denny. It was great. I certainly want to thank him for being our guest and sharing all of that incredible information with us. I enjoyed it immensely, and I hope you all did as well. I hope you guys will follow me on Facebook and on Twitter. You'll see links on my podcast page, which is... uh, dinosaurgeorgepodcast.com uh, while you're there make sure and also visit my store store at dinosaur george uh, store dot dinosaurgeorge.com and check out my website at dinosaurgeorge.com and you guys remember it is so much easier to be kind to someone rather than be rude i've never understood that reason for being rude to people especially people you've never met i mean i, I just don't i don't understand that it's like why would you want to be rude to somebody and start off what could be a friendship by and destroying it because nobody's going to take you seriously if you're going to be rude to absolutely everybody you come in contact with. Um, you know, take care of yourself. Take care of the people around you. And always remember, you guys, the world is a much better place when you're decent to each other. Thank you guys so much. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I will see you soon. Thank you for listening to The Dinosaur George Show. Please follow us on our social media links and join our mailing list. If you're interested in having Dinosaur George speak at your event, please visit our website at dinosaurgeorge.com. Until next time, keep digging for clues about the past. 